Hello and welcome to this edition of Inside Tacoma. I'm your host, Randall Lewis. Our guest for our conversation today is City Council Member Chris Beal. Welcome. Thank you, Randy. Thanks for having me. And we wanted to get to know you. You've been on the City Council for a whole five, six months now. And what's it like? What is it? Ex is it what you thought? Well, I think it's exciting. Uh, it's a lot of work, obviously. Um, serving a community is a big responsibility. And I think when you start to fill that role, you definitely fill that responsibility, feel it. Um, you know, you represent a lot of people and I represent the fifth district, which is kind of that south southern portion of Tacoma. It's divided in half by um, I-5. You've got uh, South Tacoma, west of the freeway, south end, uh, or at least half of the south end, what we call the south end. And then what I traditionally call southeast Tacoma, which I don't know that is common parlance, but I would call that kind of that, that blended area between east side, uh, east side addresses that are technically south end. Um, so it's a diverse group. Uh, we obviously have a very diverse uh, community in the south end in South Tacoma, some of the most diverse census tracts in the city. So uh, there's some, you know, there's a lot of challenges there that come along with that. Um, but I've really enjoyed working with my colleagues. I think this is a, a very, um, a council that works very well together. Um, I think that we're working towards things that are positive impacts towards the community. Uh, and it's just been, it's been great. I mean, it's been drinking from a fire hose, as they say in the beginning. Uh, but outside of that, I've, I've really enjoyed my time so far. I've enjoyed serving with the mayor who also lives, uh, I should say, in South Tacoma. We have almost a majority of council members that live uh, south of I-5, which is kind of unique, I think, for most uh, political years when you look at the council. Is, um, the mayor, actually, I'm her council member because she does live in district number five. Yeah. Uh, council member Hunter lives in district four. And then you've got Catherine Ushka, who also lives uh, on the east side. So I, I think, you know, the, the thing that I've, I've really enjoyed about our council so far is that I think we're focused on things that are, that are going to make an impact. Uh, we always talk about quality of life and that type of stuff. But I, I think just stepping into this role, I can tell the, the level of commitment with my fellow council members is to the community and, and in furthering uh, how people experience the city and how people um, live in the city and, and how we actually live and grow as a community as, as we continue to move on. So I've, I've enjoyed it a lot so far. All right. Well, but, but government, coming into government wasn't a complete shock to you because you work for government, right? right? right. You've, you've been a local government employee for a, for I have. a long now. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I'm a local city planner. Um, I work over in Puyallup in East Pierce County. Uh, I've been doing that for nearly a decade now, actually a decade this year. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've worked in local government for a long time. Um, my background is in planning. Um, I'm a, a city planner by trade. I went to, to UW Tacoma, so I'm a, uh, kind of a local product in that regard. Um, I've lived in this area for, you know, going close to 20 years now. Uh, moved out here uh, from the Boise area originally, so I'm, I'm a Northwest kid, but uh, moved out here to go to school. Um, have an urban studies degree from uh, UW Tacoma in their urban studies program. Uh, which has turned out a lot of uh, local planners and local officials. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, the transition has been pretty easy, I think, relative to how other council members step into this role in that, um, you know, I kind of understand the legislative process. I understand the planning process and, and our mandates through the Growth Management Act and those type of things. So it's been an easy transition from that standpoint, how the city operates, how, you know, the mayor envisions the city and how the city manager uh, interacts with council and, and her staff, I think, has been sort of the unique, unique experience that I've had to get used to. But um, it's been great. Yeah, the transition's been somewhat easy from that perspective. All right. When I talk to fellow city employees who, who are not elected officials, uh, I, I, one of the common things you hear them say is, well, gee, you know, the whole thing about raising money and doorbelling, we just, oh, I just, I, I, you know, I love, I love working for the local government and community and doing things in the community, but that's the part I couldn't, couldn't do. So I want to ask you, as a, as a longtime government employee who decided to become an elected official, mm -hmm. you had to go out there and then campaign and knock on doors um, and raise money. And uh, so was, was that the hard change, the hard transition from being a city employee to being a council member? Well, I mean, it's a temporary thing, but it's definitely not easy. Um, it's definitely one of the hardest things you have to do. Uh, you know, I, my campaign focused a lot on door-to-door -door contact because I think that that's the most important piece when you're particularly a district representative, right? You've got a certain geographic area that you're going to represent. You need to know the ins and outs of every neighborhood. And so when we did our campaign, um, I started door knocking. I mean, this time last year, I was probably two full months into door knocking, April and May. And we really tried to hit anybody who's voted at least once in the last four years. We went, we tried to get to their door and talk to them. So I think um, it's tiring for sure. Um, 
it, it's a lot more mentally taxing to to go out there every single day and talk about yourself. I mean, self promotion is not exactly a quality that all of us have. And I, you know, wanting to run for city council, I did that because I want to represent the community and do the best thing I can do for my community. I mean, as a as a community planner, that's what I'm I'm trained to do is build community and think about the long term and think about the big picture. And that's you know, I served on the city's planning commission for nearly six years, uh, representing District 5 and other parts of the city. Um, I've actually lived in all the districts in the city, but my wife and I uh, settled here in, in the South End and South Tacoma uh, about six years ago. And so, um, you know, I didn't do it for self-promotion. Obviously, I did it because I care about the city, and I've, I've spent a long time on the planning commission advising the city council on pretty complex land use issues for, you know, the better part of half a decade. And so I did it because I want to serve the community and I want to continue to work on that role at a, at a higher level. But yeah, I mean, a campaign is, is about the candidate, right? So you've got you've to fundraise, you've got to get out and talk about yourself every day. I mean, it's very challenging. Um, it definitely opened my eyes to how things work um, in the political realm outside of a volunteer position on a planning commission. So it was definitely tough, we'll say okay. that. All yeah. right, it, 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 is, it is a change from, from going to work and being the planner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So now this is a, Got to be, for someone in your background, uh, a very interesting time to be an elected official in a, in a, in a large city because we're going through an incredible growth period. Uh, mm -hmm. Tacoma's growth rate is higher than, even though it's still relatively small compared to some other cities, uh, it's higher than it's been in 30 years mm -hmm. or more. It's uh, growing at a faster rate. We, we know about the migration from uh, folks coming out of uh, King County and Seattle where they, they find more affordable housing in Tacoma the issues of gentrification they're beginning to per percolate up in Tacoma mm -hmm. challenges even to the growth management act because as 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 pressures get on uh, up to on growth either to densify or, or to stop sprawl people are starting to push back a little bit on on a law that's been in place for 25 years and worked fairly well um, so as a planner and a guy thinking who thinks along those lines all the time, this has got to be a pretty exciting time to also then be a policymaker because this is kind of right up your alley. It is, <laughs> yeah. I mean, as planners, I think what we always say is we're change agents, right? I mean, there's nothing in, in city planning that doesn't deal with change and progress and how we move forward as a community. And I think the mandates under a growth management act kind of set that out for every community is that cities and urban areas are going to grow and how that happens is going to be sort of that gray area of government that you know the community gets to provide input on and decide what does our community look like but at the same time i think you said it right i mean communities especially urban areas especially tacoma being one of the you know and i when we we went to dc recently as a, a city council and, and talked to some of our congressional delegation i like to remind people who are in dc that you know tacoma is not small town tacoma is one of the largest cities you know top five cities in a three to five state area, depending upon how you look at it, as one of the largest cities in the Pacific Northwest. And so we have a pretty big obligation as to setting a good example as to how growth is going to occur, um, how we deal with equity, how we deal with gentrification as growth occurs, um, how we deal with transportation issues as growth occurs. So yeah, it's an exciting time, um, you know, and, and having been on the Planning Commission, I was the chair of the Planning Commission for the last three years, including uh, overseeing the update to our comprehensive plan, which is kind of the city's big roadmap to how we're going to grow over time. And we set out a pretty ambitious, you know, goal. That's our, that was our big update as mandated by the state. And we're supposed to take a much longer vision when we do those bigger updates. And what we do know is that the city is going to continue to grow and rapidly. Um, this area is desirable for people to live because of jobs, because of the arts community because of universities and because of our natural environment. And so how do we protect those areas that are closer to Mount Rainier? How do we protect uh, further out to prevent sprawl? How do we densify without creating you know, unnecessary or uh, impacts that maybe aren't anticipated? But change is gonna occur, right? I mean, we're not always gonna be sort of uh, always single family every you know, place or zoned residential. We're gonna see more mixed infill development um, we're going to see more development that's going to have affordable housing mixed in with it. 
uh, you know, you've seen that already this year with what council has done um, with the Tacoma Mall sub area plan, which is a regional growth center, not only just for the city, it's a regional growth center. So that's a center of importance for not only Pierce County, but for the region, the three county region, largely. Uh, that's where a lot of our growth is going to occur in both housing and jobs. And what council looked at at that time is, OK, so we're going to see a lot of growth. What we don't completely want or we don't want at all is people being displaced from that and being you know, basically gentrified. And so we looked at a policy that will integrate uh, housing in with market rate housing to allow people to stay where they're at. Um, I think we're, we're still gonna see a lot of that in places like Hilltop where we've got uh, the light rail uh, line extending and um, working with the uh, Tacoma Housing Authority on, on what does that look like and, and how do they develop their properties uh, to integrate people back into, in, and keep them into their community. Um, because we don't want to lose that social capital. And I think that that's what makes Tacoma Tacoma is keeping play people in place. We have very distinct areas of the city. I mean, the South End is not Proctor and Proctor is not in the South End. So there are distinct identities and distinct parts of the city. And we need to continue to look at how we address all of those pieces, but keep the, keep the mindset that the umbrella over all this is we are going to grow, we are going to change. What does that look like? So it's an exciting time, as you said. Yeah, it is. And, and I want to I don't want to spend the entire program on planning, but there, you, you mentioned um, the Tacoma Mall Summary Plan, where, which Im included something that Tacoma had never done before, which was the planning term is inclusionary zoning. Mm -hmm. Um, but as you say, that basically that's a requirement that, in, in, that if you're going to build multifamily homes, you have to have some affordable units in there, as, as well as defined by, a, by certain stat statutes. But that actually, Tacoma's talked about that for years and years and years, but actually implementing it, I mean, you, you read a couple of negative comments maybe on social media, but it really was not as big a deal. Um, and, and maybe it, I, I, I thought it, I was struck by how little outcry there was about it, either pro or con. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like, oh, oh, yeah, OK, sure, that's something that was important to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just wondering if, if all of the pressures about growth that are facing the entire region, if people have kind of gotten go to the point of, oh, yeah, well, well yeah, we have to do this kind of stuff because yeah. it, it's important now. It is. And I think people recognize that. I mean, I think our constituencies, when you talk to any council member, You've got a lot of people on both sides of, of the ball um, saying, look, I mean, this is going to happen. We get it. it. It happens in other communities. It's happened in other communities for long periods of time. You know, you've got hundreds of hundreds and close to thousand communities across the country that do this type of inclusionary zoning, as you said, the, the technical term. But I think, you know, there are ways that we've balanced that. And, I, and some of that's just built into state law, for example, to for the city to even contemplate a requirement like that. We have to give the property owner some kind of offset, right? So you've got to basically upzone that property, give them some additional, like in the example of the mall, we gave property owners within the area affected, we gave them an additional floor of height to offset that. I mean, you've got different dwelling units and obviously that affects the cost of their development um, to require you know, some of those units to be set aside at rent or price controlled uh, numbers. So what the state law says is if it's a jurisdiction is gonna do that through their zoning controls, you've got to give them some kind of offset. And so we tried to balance that with a, a number of different things. And I think that's why you didn't see the controversies. I think we found that we struck a really good balance between what we hear from people that are experiencing gentrification, what we hear from, from people who are the advocates in this industry saying, you should have been doing this a long time ago. We need to get ahead of this before gentrification occurs. But you also see, and I, and I met with a developer soon after um, we talked about that, who owns property in the area affected, he was completely fine with it. I mean, he said, you, you offset a lot of this develop, uh, you know, these requirements by giving me the additional floor, reducing off-street parking requirements for me, um, which reduces the cost of my development greatly. And so I think what we tried to do is, was do what we always do with any kind of legislation, mostly, is try to sp strike that balance. Where's the balance point between you know, what the government would like to do to better the community with property rights and, and those type of things? And I think we really looked at that fulcrum and tried to find where that balance point in that sweet spot is. Obviously, part of this you know, endeavor in that it's new is constantly checking to make sure what we did w is working. But I think as a first step, I think we really took some bold action. And I think that's what this council is going to be about is bold action on these things, like with um, tenant protections and with um, affordable housing and, and whatever else we might work on. I think we're trying to push the ball forward and not necessarily delay things, um, but we're trying to be inclusive with, with all of the community, but work towards that balance point and, and action. So essentially what the Tacoma Mall plan does now is with the downtown 
plan. I mean, Tacoma can accommodate a great deal of the expected growth that it would have in those two areas of the city, uh, downtown and the Tacoma Mall mm -hmm. area. Um, and the side effect of that is, is, is it true that the side effect of that is that takes, should take pressure off of densifying other places like the southeast end of the city or South Tacoma mm -hmm. uh, or even the north end and other, you know, kind of protecting single family neighborhoods, mm -hmm. historic single family neighborhoods from that kind of growth? Is, is that kind of side effect? Of I would say that that, that has been traditionally the city's growth um, policy. I mean, if you look at our policies and our comprehensive plan, it does say regional growth centers, but also the, the major strategy we've had for a long time is mixed use centers, which are not regional, and I don't want to get too wonky here, but regional growth centers and mixed use centers, not the same thing, but essentially kind of similar. You think um, one area of activity in the city that you see a lot of growth in mixed use centers, Proctor. Um, and so when we look at those areas, that's where we're anticipating a lot of growth. I don't want to say that that's going to be the only area that we're going to grow. Obviously, we're going to see infill housing in single family neighborhoods. And uh, what the council did uh, about a year and a half ago with our residential infill pilot program, um, we're looking at how do we grow in, in compatible ways with single family neighborhoods. But yeah, I think you're going to see some of those changes. And we've done some corridor studies. Um, for example, Pacific Avenue could be a good example where we do still have some areas, you know, Pacific Avenue, if you compare it to other major corridors like, say, South Meridian and South Hill. South Meridian and South Hill is just kind of your classic commercial sprawling development for miles and miles and miles. If you look at Pacific Avenue, we actually have distinct areas that are commercial and then you almost get into, you get into single family residential on They've some of those. They've been there for ever and ever. Forever, yeah. yeah, and some of those major areas. And I think, you know, as we look at like Pacific Avenue as a good, cor as a good example corridor where we're working with Pierce Transit now on bus rapid transit to try to improve the capacity of, of the one line, moving a lot more people uh, to and from you know, the outer parts of the county into downtown, which connects people to regional transportation and jobs. Um, I think what you're going to start to see is some of those areas where we need, to, we need to rethink what does that look like. And I also think we need to look at what does the term single family, what does that look like? And what does the character, what does the character of each of those neighborhoods mean to people? Um, and I think we've seen some of that development already occurring where Maybe it is single family, but it doesn't meet the character. And I, I, the example I come up with in my neighborhood uh, is the Manitou area, uh, kind of in southwest Tacoma. Uh, we had a new development come in where it is single family, but Manitou's got a very distinct feel to it. It's, got a, it's almost like a character district in the sense that it was developed at a certain time period. There are smaller houses. The street grid and, and the layout is very unique. And we had another neighborhood come in. Um, it was where the old Manitou Community Center was when it was torn down and surplused. And that development is actually more of a front-loaded, kind of a, you could place that house anywhere in East Pierce County in the suburbs and it would look normal, but it looks very out of place in that area. And so when we talk about protection of single family neighborhoods, we're not just talking about, oh, we don't want like a, an apartment complex right in the middle of, you know, a, a single family R2 area. But what we're talking about also is character districts and how do we identify those. But again, I think when we go back to the mandates under growth management, the mandates under our comp plan, we need to grow. And so does the character of single family neighborhoods look a little bit different? I think maybe it does over time. I think we're talking pretty seriously about um, allowing detached accessory dwelling units, which has been a hot topic over the decades in Tacoma. Uh, we're also talking about two and three family uh, housing. That was part of the, the infill pilot program. Cottage housing, which is kind of a, a unique product as part of a plan development. There's a lot of these, I don't, again, don't mean to get too wonky, but it's kind of my area. But um, I think when we start looking at that type of housing, you're gonna start looking at some incremental changes in our single family neighborhoods to accommodate growth. We can't expect there to be, you know, six story buildings in every single mixed use center without us growing. And so I think we're gonna be having a pretty frank discussion about that type of housing here in the near future in terms of permanency, so. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Well, the other thing that uh, I, I know you'll begin to spend a lot more time on uh, as we as we move through summer and into into fall is the budget, because this is one of those years where the city council adopts a, a two year budget uh, later this year. The city manager has to present one to you in the fall um, and it has to be balanced and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I know there's work going on with staff because I get the memos uh, about things that people want to changes in their budget to propose to the manager before she makes her presentation to the council. Uh, council went through a 
process of identifying its priorities early mm -hmm. early in the year. That that that's certainly shaping the decisions that the manager will make, uh, in, in what she presents. So you haven't really gotten into it much yet, but it's coming. Um, but but I'm guessing you've had some thoughts about things that you'd like to see mm -hmm. priorities changed in how things are funded in the city. So if, if you have begun to communicate those to the city manager and kind of and your colleagues to say, oh, hey, you know, can we maybe you know, shift this to here and look at this kind of a new idea that mm -hmm. we haven't tried before. Yeah, and I think you know part of that is coming up with with ideas, like you said, and and kind of coordinating with your colleagues on where does that go. Um, I definitely have put some thought process into that. We're still pretty early in the year, but you know that budget process comes soon, and it's a it's a lengthy process because it's a biennial type of thing. So it's important to to have your ducks in a row and, and to be thinking about it early. I think the things that. I think about a lot are the things that affect my district and having gone through the district three times during my campaign, you learn a lot about you know the problem areas. And I think the biggest issue when I, whenever I was asked on the campaign and even now that affects Southeast Tacoma is just public safety. Um, obviously we're still suffering from the cutbacks that we had in our public safety services during the downturn. And we're talking largely about police services and the sort of unmet expectation that, that the community has between what our public safety should be providing, what our police department should be providing in terms of services, and what the community expects. And that's not at fault because of what police are doing. It's just we're, we're down. I mean, you look at like our community liaison officer program, our community policing program. Our CLO program was essentially cut in half in most of our police sectors. And so when you had four or five CLOs who can deal with the community issues, deal with those really intense, you know, neighborhood specific crime issues or property crime or um, drug use or uh, people experiencing homelessness or whatever that might be, um, you see a cutback in the ability for our officers and especially our CLO officers, which are really a critical link between you know, neighborhood safety, community quality, and public safety and how we, we police the community. When we have that program essentially cut in half, we've just seen you know, a, a rapid decline in people's ability to feel like if I call the police, they'll show up. Well, they do for very critical issues, but some minor issues, you know, there there may be an expectation that you're going to do some self-reporting online or something like that. And I just I hear a lot about that um, from from the people that I represent, and I think that there's a gap there. And I think honestly, the majority of city council, when you kind of go through our priority setting at our retreat this year, public safety is one of the number one, if not the number one, thing that we need to work on to improve the quality of life. I mean. We're going to continue to grow and crime is going to continue to happen and how do we address that? Um, and so I think for me, public safety, obviously getting more officers trained, obviously we have budgetary things for that now. Um, continuing to build on that progress to get us back to where we were I think is extremely important. Um, some of the other things that I've been thinking about too though are just kind of our basic services. I mean I think that when we look at some of those things that the community just expects as basic functions like street lighting for example we don't necessarily have a program right now that in we're doing a great job at, at retrofitting all of our street lights to leds and i think we get a lot of commendation for that which is good but we have wholesale streets that don't have street lights and so we're looking at some just those basic things i think we should be taking small bites or bigger bites at the apple on on say installing net new street lighting um, looking at our, our uh, backlog of hazard sidewalks and whose responsibility is that and traditionally it's been you know, the abutting property owner. And I get a lot of complaints about that. Somebody buys a house, they didn't realize they have to help maintain the sidewalk that's city property. And so I think some of those things we need to get back to the basics on. We need to be able to provide some of those line items to replace street lights if they're knocked down. I had one guy just emailed me the other day about a street light that got knocked down near a school. And it's gonna take months because we just don't have the set aside to replace that street light immediately. And the person who hit it in their car didn't have car insurance. and so. A lot of that stuff we need to, I think, do a better job at providing those basic city services and then try to kind of radiate out from that, that piece. But again, I think you know the public safety piece is a big piece to it. The, the, the basics that we provide for um, in the community in terms of what we should be doing is, is important. But I also think housing is, is really important. Obviously, when you continue to see growth, you're gonna continue to see housing costs skyrocketing. And so how do we work with THA? How do we work with our community partners? on addressing um, housing issues, preventing people from experiencing homelessness and those type of things I think are gonna be continue to be really key for me as I start looking at the budget. All right, well we have just like two minutes left so real Great. quick quick, quick question and quick answer here. 
a top priority for the something you said, I've got to get this done before the end of 2018? Uh, the one thing that I am really hot on right now, uh, two things, I would say, um, obviously the tenant protection stuff that we've been working on this spring has been really important. That's going to be going through committee and we do have a timeline for that because uh, the regulations we passed about um, evictions uh, is set to expire in September. So we need to get that stuff done. That actually was an item that I had brought to the chair of the community vitality and safety meetings in late January after my campaign because it's something that I heard from a lot from renters. Um, and I think that it's a really important issue. So to me, that had been when I walked in that first month and, and talking to Councilmember Blocker about wanting that to be a work item on the committee that I serve on. And now with, uh, with the stuff we've seen with the Tiki residents and that type of stuff has accelerated that. I think that was one of my top priorities. Um, but also looking at the uh, secondary issue, like I just mentioned about infill housing, I think that there are opportunities for us to legalize some of those um, interim housing laws. Uh, this year. I think that we can start doing that outreach now and I think that discussion will start to occur this summer. So those are kind of two hot button issues for me. I think this year for me, you know, working on public safety through the budget, working on those basic items through the budget, but also just working on legislative fixes for how we're doing infill housing, how we're protecting tenants and how we're working on housing because I think that is one of the biggest needs and I think that was reflected in our retreat and our policy setting uh, type of stuff is that equity housing, public safety, those type of things are what this council's focusing on and is a priority for me and I think my constituents as well. All right. Well, appreciate you being here and we will have you back if you're willing of to come talk about it some more in the future. All okay. right. Thanks. Thanks, Randy. Our guest has been City Council Member Chris Beal. We look forward to seeing you next time here on Inside Tacoma.